In today's installment of Intro to Programming, we're going to be looking at using variables, conditionals, creating movement, and the magic of using minus one, some functions to organize things. So we've got a lot to uh, do, but a big part of what it's ultimately going to do is be about organizing our code. So our code is going to become more usable, more flexible, and more readable. So variables are a way that we store information. This is how we're able to keep track of a piece of data in our project. So if we want or need to access the same piece of information later on in a program, it's better to store it in a variable. Because when we do that, we can just change that variable once when we read through the code, we know what that item is referring to. So it's going to make things a whole lot easier as our programs grow in complexity. There are different kinds of variables that we will use. We will have integers, floats, characters, strings, and booleans. So an integer is a whole number. It can be a positive number, it can be zero, it can be negative, but it's a whole number. There's no fractional or decimal component on it, opposed to a float, which may or may not have a decimal. It doesn't have to, but if we know that when we're storing that number, it possibly will need a fractional component or a decimal component, then we must use a float. If we try and assign a float number or use a float number in place of an integer, it could generate a problem or an error in our code. So we have to be aware of which type of numbers that we're working with when we use numbers. So computers are pretty particular on this point. Now a character is just simply an individual character. So individual letters, and we can store numbers but they won't have a numerical value, we will store their character representation. So we would see that number on screen, but it's just simply working like a letter. It's not a mathematical number that we could use. A string is one or more characters combined together. You will notice that the string data type has a capital S. All the other previous data types had a lowercase s. We will talk more about that because string is really it's con called a class. So it's a special type of data type that is a composite. So it has multiple things in it. It has multiple characters. So because it's not a elemental data type, but it instead is something that is comprised of multiple individual elemental data types, it is then a class. So we'll learn all about classes in coming sessions. Now a boolean is just simply something that can have two possible values, true or false. So these are really useful when we're trying to ask questions of the computer or we want to store something. We want to find out, hey, is a key being pressed down, true or false? Is the mouse button being pressed, true or false? Is a particular value equal to some other value or to a fixed value like a number. So we could say is x equal to 23. So we're asking something, is it true or false? We can ask it as a question or we can store an assignment. So Booleans are ultimately, they seem so simple and you're like, well, when do I need to use it? Turns out you use it all the time when you're coding. So it's something that you just get used to using that you don't even really think about it as a boolean you're just storing that piece of information that is going to be true or false so that does lead us into our next topic that we will be adding into our programs which is conditionals so conditionals are questions that have a true or a false answer so we do it in the way that in plain language, we say if something is true, we perform one action, otherwise we do something else. Now, I've put it a uh, text version of a conditional statement on screen, and now what's important is the punctuation. So we can see that we put our question we're asking inside 
parentheses, and then we have curly braces, and every time you have a parenthesis or a curly brace, it must have a left and a right one. So it always needs a partner. You can't abandon it. You can't have a single open parenthesis or a single closed parenthesis, and you can't have a single curly brace or square brace or any other type of grouping punctuation without having its mate. So always remember when your code starts breaking, it's often because you forgot to include the mate, the partner of your parenthesis or curly brace or square bracket. And finally, the last item we'll be using in this episode is going to be the magic of negative one. Because math is magic, multiplication within that can be magic. So if we have a value and we multiply it by negative one, it changes it from positive to negative or negative to positive. So we can see how that works. If we take 25 and multiply it by minus one, it becomes negative 25. Negative three times negative one, the two negatives cancel each other out and become a positive. It also works with decimal numbers because it's just a number and when we multiply by two negatives, it's a positive. Multiply by a single negative, so we take a positive value times it by minus one, it becomes negative. And that's useful because say we set our we're going to have a speed value when we animate something across the screen. And as we do that, it's going to then be moving in a positive speed. And then when a certain condition occurs, we will want to invert that speed to make it negative. So it goes back in the other direction. So I have the example that we will be working towards in this video. And you can see how every time it hits the side margin, it changes its direction. So the condition I'm looking for is, has my face hit the right edge or the left edge? And when I do, I want to invert or change my speed to that opposite value. So now, let's take a look at the code. Before we get into the code, I do want to point out one thing, and that I did go in under my tools menu and I chose theme selectors. So the current version of processing allows us to choose different themes. And the default is the blue theme, but I'm switching to the gray theme because I think that that lower contrast just makes the code on screen just a little bit easier to read. So we're going to work with that now. You can use whatever theme makes you happy. So you can go for a dark theme, dark grays, reds, yellows. So a lot of these I find, especially if they're going to show up on video to be a little bit distracting. So that's why I'm going to go with this just lighter gray theme. So if you're wondering why suddenly I went from the blue to the gray, change your theme. You're going to find that you can customize it to make it exactly to how you want it to be. So we have additional options that you can go with. I just think that this is the most least obtrusive of all the themes as I cycle through them. So that's the one I'm going to use. If you want to roll your own theme and customize it to make it ideal for you, I encourage you to do so. But if you are trying to follow along exactly and you want things to match, then I'm using the gray theme now instead of the default blue, just because I think the lesser contrast is easier to see on screen. All right, so this animated version is what we're going to be working towards. And we have a couple of things that we need to start discussing as we work with that. So we do have to work with the variables. We also have to introduce function. So I have changed the name of and the description in my comment as to what this project is. Now what a function is, is a function is just simply a way to encapsulate and hold a set of instructions that we want to tell the computer that this is what we want to do. And when we do that, what's really impressive about it is we can then call that function as many times as we want. So we have a couple functions that are built into processing that we need to use when we want to animate. And then we have 
our custom functions that we're going to create instead of just using pre-built things. So what I'm first going to do is write out my first two functions and we start out with the word void. Now inside of processing in Java we need to tell the program what we expect to get back from this function because some functions give us back something they return a value to us and some functions don't so if we start out by declaring the word void that means we're not expecting this function to give us back anything we just want it to execute or run so void and then the first function that we typically call is setup. So I do the name of the function, two parentheses, the left and the right, and then I do a left curly brace. I hit return twice on my keyboard, and then I put in my closing curly brace. Now the reason that we do that is it's really easy to always forget that closing curly brace when we're writing our code. And if we do that, our program will break. Because if I don't have that closing curly, yeah, it's gonna break because I only open it. So we must always put in that closing curly and then you up arrow and then you can start typing whatever code that you want. So that if you get in the habit every time you type opening curly hit return twice close curly make that a mantra in your brain. So I say this all the time when I'm coding it where it's like okay the function name print open parenthesis close parenthesis open curly brace return twice close curly brace up arrow. So if you're always just kind of saying that not out loud probably. Your uh, People nearby may look at you funny or you know, housemates or roommates may be a little disturbed if you're working in a lab classroom. Probably not the best idea, but when you're by yourself you can talk to yourself. It's all good. So we can put some instructions in it, but I'm going to create the second named function that is built into processing. So again it starts with void and I say draw. Well, not draw. D-R-A-W, open parenthesis, close parenthesis, open curly, return twice, close parenthesis. And I'm going to just put a return between those so it looks a little bit better. So now you can see that I have an open and close. So these, when we look at them, by their name and function names should be kind of reflective of what they do. They should be something that means something to you. Now these are ones that are built into it. Setup is a function that runs at the beginning when your sketch or your program is executed or when you hit the, the play button, the run button. It runs one time. Draw will run approximately 60 times per second. So it depends on how much kind of processing or thinking the computer has to do for exactly how quickly it runs because we will see in the coming sessions that we will write a program that draw, well, draw was the wrong word, but uh, slows down the execution of draw to only a couple iterations or a couple frames per second. So it's attempting to always go at 60, but it will find that often the program is incapable of doing that if you have written really complex or convoluted or inefficient code. So setup runs once, draw runs 60 times per second. That's kind of what we're aiming for. So certain things like setting the size of our sketch, setting the background color, these we really only need to do once. So I'm going to cut those using on the keyboard, uh, command or control X. We can also look under, you know, cut, copy, paste. So we're using cut, copy, and then I will now use paste, which is command V. So XCV, those are common things that we use. Now, talked a little bit about uh, white space last time and extra returns makes it more readable. What's also useful is to have our indents configured correctly. And the indents that we make so that inside of curly braces we normally will do indents and then if we have curly braces within curly braces then we indent again and it helps for readability so you can insert those yourself by hitting the tab key but you can also under edit we have auto format command T or control T on Windows and now that auto formats it now some of you may have been looking on the screen and noticed that we get this line of code underlined in red and it's underlined in red because 
it's like, wait, what's going on? This we can't have a fill statement outside of this function. It's now growing really grumpy about that. So we need to take the rest of our code that we have here. So let's go grab this. So I will again cut it, Commander Control X, and go into my draw function and paste. Commander Control V and then Commander Control T and that auto formats it. And now we don't see any red. Kind of looks about the same. We just took our code and put it into these functions. Now let's hit play and see what happens. And popped up onto the wrong screen. There we go. So it looks the same as before. That's really cool. But now it's time to start configuring this so we can animate it. Because right now we are declaring each of these objects on screen. So we declare the circle at these fixed pixel locations. And that's fine, but I can't really animate it because how do I change those numbers? But if we remember, the circle is it has an X position or a horizontal component. It has a vertical or Y position and it has a size. So if I want to change this horizontal component and this vertical component, if I store those numbers in a variable, I can now just add something to that value and it's going to change. So let's do that. So when we declare variables, what we first have to do is we have to start out before our setup statement and we have to define the variable. And we're defining it outside of the function because that allows that variable to have what is called a global scope, meaning anywhere within our program we can have access to it. So I'm going to create two variables to store some numbers and two variables to store some speeds, a horizontal speed and a vertical speed. Now we can do it like this, float, so we define what kind of variable it's going to be. Then I'll give it a name and we can semicolon because again it's the end of a line. Now if we're defining multiple variables all of the same type, we can actually do it on one line, like I will do with the speeds. So if I do speed x, so that will store our horizontal, I can put in a comma, speed y, and then semicolon at the end. So I could have put all four of these, just float x comma y comma speed x comma speed y, or I can put all four in separate lines. It depends on how you want to do it for your readability. So I typically will group variables when they're of similar, well, they have to be of the same type, but when they're kind of performing a similar duty, I would group them. So I'd go float x, y, because that's my position information. And then my speed information, I would probably put on a second line because I'm storing that separately. That's how I've grown accustomed to liking things that makes it easier to read. So we've now defined our variables, but we haven't given them a value yet. To give them a value, we do their starting, their initial value, we do that inside setup. So I'm going to say x is going to be equal to, and well, right now I'm just going to do the same place where it starts. I'll go 400. Y is going to be equal to 300. And then speed x is going to be equal to, we'll just throw in a random number like 5. And speed y is going to be equal to 0, because right now I'm not going to want it to go up or down. So we've defined some variables. We've given those variables numbers. Put them on screen. Now, my circle here. If I just simply say instead of 400, well, let's see, 400, x is equal to 400, so I'm just going to put an x there. My y, 300, oh look, that's 300, so I'll just put a y here. Now if I run this, we'll see that no change. No change at all. All right, now I'm going to put some lines of code in. Okay, I guess there's still enough room at the end here. So I'll just go, I'm going to say X. Well, what if I want X to keep growing or changing? So I'll say X, 
I want X to go up, so I'm going to add to it speed X. Actually, I'm going to make speed X slower because otherwise it's going to be 5 will happen pretty quick. I'm going to slow it down for now. Now, this says X is going to be equal to X, which started out at 400 plus speed X. Now, the first time draw runs, it'll be 400 and 1. 400, then 401, then 402, because then 401 plus speed x, which is 1, 402, etc., etc. Now let's run this and see what we get. And we can see that that circle is moving across the screen. We'll also notice when we look on screen here that we get this kind of weird line. And what's happening, let's run it again, is the black outline of that circle. We're just seeing that happen over and over and over as it moves across the screen. So, one thing that we can do is we can clear our background. So we can clear our background by just calling the background command or you can say fill. Now I'm going to just repeat the background color which is 7F67 E3 and then I'm going to draw a rectangle from 0 comma 0 to the full width of my screen and the full height of my screen. I'm going to just put in a little note here. Clear background. Now if I run it, watch. You can see where now that circle is moving. Now I don't I'm not checking to find out when I hit the side of the screen yet. We're not using any conditionals, we will. So then we can create that bounce effect, move it back and forth. But first, before we do that, I think we should, what would be nice is to take care of the rest of the objects. So each of these other objects, the eyes, the mouth, the nose, are all relative in position to that circle. So if we think about that circle being at the center of this head, well this eye, Instead of x at 400, well, it's 300. So really what that is is x minus 100. Now 500, if we compare that to x being 400, uh, 500 here, this is just simply x plus 100. Now the y values, y was 300, so these are now 250, so that's 50 less. So y minus 50 and y minus 50. So what we're doing is we're creating that relative location. We're drawing these in relation to, now we can see the eyes are moving with it. And it is a good practice while you're working. Always just keep testing. Just hit run, hit run, hit run to see are you getting the result that you expect? Because if you by accident, you know, type in something like x here instead, you'll be like, whoa which is actually kind of fun, but I don't think that's what you're trying to do. So it's really easy to mess those up. Okay, so the mouth, 300. That is 100 less than our starting of 400, so it's just simply x minus 100. This is 350, that's 50 more, so y plus 50. And the triangle. So 400, well, that's x. We'll do all three x's here. This is 425, so that's x plus 25. And this is 375, so that would be x minus 25. Now, see the y. So this is y minus 50. And this is going to be y plus 20. And y plus 20. So now, again, run it. Let's see what we get. So the body parts are moving with it. So we've, we've made progress here. We've been able to organize this. Now if we were to verify that our Y's are working, I'll make my speed Y one as well. And let's now repeat the process here. Y is equal to Y plus speed Y. And again, end with a semicolon. Now let's run this and see. And the whole thing moves. We don't have parts dislocating on us, so that's good. 
So we've been able to now use some basic variables to store our position information. So X and Y are just a position information and we're drawing these elements relative to, relative to a specific registration or origin point. In this case, it's the center of my object. Now, what I really want to do is I, I want to organize my code a little bit. I want to clean up my draw function because ultimately we don't want our draw functions to be really complex. We, we want to simplify these out and say what we're really doing is we're clearing our background. I want to update my creature information which will update its position and check to see if it's bouncing off the walls. And finally I want to then display that creature on screen. So three things. So really I just want my draw to do three separate things. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create those. I'm just going to put some extra returns so I can move my code up on screen, make it a little easier to follow along. I want to create three new methods here. Void, clear background, two parentheses, curly brace, return twice, closing curly brace. Now, void, update creature, curly brace, return twice, close curly brace, and we would up arrow if I wasn't creating a final function. Void, update, or not update, display creature. So, three functions. And what we're gonna find is, by doing this, we're able to organize our code. So, Currently, we're only updating position. We're also gonna then be checking for, hey, if I hit the bounds of the screen or not, so it can create my little bouncing critter. So I'm going to cut these out of here, Commander Control X, and that will go into my update, and it's simply a Commander Control V, or paste. So I paste that in, that updates my creature. Now let's go find my clear in my background here. I'm going to cut that. I'm going to clear background. Paste that in. All right. Finally, my critter here. So let's cut that out of here. Paste that in. The next thing we get to do is just simply say clear background. And we put two parentheses and a semicolon. So we put the name of our function. So the name of the function is clear background. And then the two parentheses say, yeah, I want to call this function. So when we reference variables in our code, we reference it just with the variable. But when we're referencing functions, because think of a function as a verb, variable is more of a noun. It's an attribute. So if we described a person through variables, we could describe your location, X and Y. We could describe your height, how tall you are. We could describe your width, your depth. Heck, we could even give you, you know, a weight value if we wanted. We can also, you know, if we're talking about a person, we can describe eye color, hair color, age, name. These are all variables that we could store in relation to a specific person. So we have these, they're kind of, Nouns are they're descriptors, they're information about a thing. That's generally what we do with a variable. Functions are verbs, they're actions, things we want to do. So when we call them, we put the parentheses after it. This is pretty typical across many, many programming languages. This is how we go about doing it. And we call update creature and finally display creature. So looking at my code, I've now organized it into specific functions. Each function is doing essentially one thing. Display is just handling the display. Update is just handling update and clearing background is just handling clearing background. So each of these functions are doing one thing, which is a great way to do it. You're better off making multiple functions and calling them than making a function that does like 10 different things. 
because over time it becomes much harder to manage it when your program starts to grow to hundreds or thousands of lines of code if you have it organized into functions it's going to be much 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 easier to maintain and to verify we didn't break anything I'll just hit run and we can see that yep still working so we've made a lot of progress here we have updated it so that we can animate it we have updated it using functions we've used variables now we want to look at how can we check to see if it hits a boundary and once it hits that boundary we want to change that direction so we're going to now use conditionals and our magic minus one to use our conditionals we need to ask questions and the question we want to ask, and sometimes it's helpful to write out your code, and then once you do, you can translate it into actual programming code. So if I say if creature hits right edge, reverse direction. So I'll put that into a comment so it, I don't get that evil nastiness on it. All right, so how do we write that in our language? So if we say if, and then we have our parentheses, then we'll have curly brace, return twice, close curly brace. So inside the parentheses, this is where we ask our question. So what we care about is if our x, because that's our position that determines if we've hit the right edge. So if x, is hitting that right edge. So we have to know that, well, let's see, x starts at 400. Okay, that's good. Now, my creatures all contain within that circle. If your creature has body parts that exist outside of, say, the head shape, you're going to have to use different numbers as part of your values. But as I look at this, okay, the head, the head is 400 pixels big we're drawing from its middle so that means it has a radius of 200 so what we really care about is when the X is greater than width which is the whole width of my stage which happens to be 800 minus 200 so 200 is half of the width of my critter so when X is greater than that value what we want to do is say speed x and now we will use our magical times no speed x is equal to sorry speed x is equal to speed x times minus one now let me just put a space in there make it a little more readable so speed x is equal to speed x so the same way that we added speed x now when speed x is positive, in this case it's 1, I'm going to change my value here up to 5, and we're going to make speed y 0 for now, because I don't want it going off screen, otherwise it will just keep getting lower and lower and lower, because we're only doing a part at a time. So, when our x is greater than, bigger than the width, minus 200, so the width is 800, so technically I could say, I could just type 600 in, but if at some point I modify my sketch and say, you know, I want it to be 1200, the code will still work. This is part of the advantage of using things that are stored in variables. Now width and height, these are the variables that are built into processing that are storing the size information of my sketch. So once I say the word size and put in numbers, those numbers are able to be referenced by the word width and the word height anywhere in my code. So I don't have to store, you know, write an additional variable assignment to it and say, you know, program width and program height. We have these built in. So remembering that processing was designed to make your life easier by having certain common things pre-baked or pre-built into the code. 
That's where width and height come into play. In other languages, we might have to then kind of query the system and say, hey, how big is the screen we're working on? And then store that number in it. If we're going to have our program work on, say, multiple screens or screens that can change size even as a program is running, such as like on a phone going from portrait to landscape. So things we have to care about. Or on your computer where you make the browser window bigger and smaller, that changes the viewing area, which changes our kind of screen size, which then we have to take that into account. So variables are your friend when working on computers and writing code. So speed, we will reverse it. So speed what? You know, now I'm using five. So speed x is now equal to five times minus one. So it should become negative five. So let's run this and see. And we can see now, and it disappears. So we figured out one side. Now if we go to the other side and say if x is less than, well, the left edge is simply zero. So we can say zero minus 200. I could just put negative 200, but I like the same way I have width minus, then I have zero. I just find that that, it's not necessary, but when we're learning about code, I do find it a little bit easier to work with. It, I believe, helps people to understand a little bit more, even though we know that zero is just simply zero. And I can put spaces in here, make it a little better. I don't always put spaces in in my own writing, but when I try and write code for demos, I usually try and put all the spaces and returns and get it all nice and pretty looking. So now we can see, well, oh, not minus 200, my bad, because now it goes, the whole, the whole thing disappears all the way off screen. So if we did want it to go all the way off screen and then reverse, yeah, we achieved that. And we can do that here if we just did uh, change that to a plus, now run it, we'll see that the thing goes all the way off screen and then reverses. But that's, I want it to stay on screen. So this one should be a minus, and this one needs to be a plus. So now let's run it and see, did we achieve our result? Perfect. If we create speed y of five, now we can do the same thing with speed y. I'm gonna just warn you, it's very tempting. You highlight this, copy it, paste it, change the speed axis to speed y's, widths to heights, and you're like, I'm good. And invariably what happens when you do that is you miss one of the x's or y's and then it does not work correctly. So if y is greater than height, minus 200, and again, if you have body parts, arms, legs, hats, ears, horns, sticking out, you your value won't be 200, it will be something else. So you have to work with what is in your program. Oh, and I did exactly what I said not to do, is I did not put in my closing curly right away. If, we'll do it this time, but not phi, if y is less than zero plus 200, now let's go put a space up here just so it looks consistent. And then curly brace, return twice, close curly, up arrow. See, perfect. Speed y is now equal to speed y times minus one. Now I'll auto format, command or control T. Let's run this and we should see it now bounce on all four edges. So we've now achieved animation by storing our position information in a variable, updating that variable 60 times a second, give or take, and then we have conditionals checking to see when that value reaches certain benchmarks. In this case, when it would put the artwork off screen. And then when that occurs, we invert those speed values of speed X and speed Y. 
we've accomplished a lot here. We have variables, we have functions, we have built-in functions, functions that are organizing our code. We are now using conditionals to ask questions because ultimately if everything we do is declarative where we just execute, execute, execute without taking into account any questions, a program isn't really doing much because it will never change. It just runs. It'd be like, oh, I want a counting program to just count forever. One, two, three, four, five. Well, we could ha set a value or number that we're currently counting, add to it, and then just keep running forever. But then kind of what's the point? So this is where learning and getting comfortable with conditionals is going to give you so much more control. Because once we have conditionals in our program, we can start asking all kinds of questions. And once we're storing information or data inside variables, then we can continually be updating that. So now if I wanted to create a game, I would store my score as a variable, maybe my player lives as a variable, then I would have every enemy that I encounter stored as a variable object so that I could then reference it. Every time if I can shoot, I would have whatever I'm shooting, my projectiles, those would be stored in variables. So we have lots of different things. If it's an adventure game and I can level up, then maybe the damage that I can inflict changes as I level up. So I store that in a variable. So once you start understanding how to use variables, how to store them in your program, how to use conditionals to ask questions, you are on your, you are on your way to making greatness. Good luck and have fun.